Hey everyone, in this video we are going to talk about designing the uh, user interface for your applications because there's quite a bit that goes into that. Um, we're going to be covering F2.2, Windows Standards for uh, Interfaces, and A2.2, Design an Interface Using the Windows Standards. I won't be going into the example that they do in A2.2. Um, the entire uh, application section of this chapter is the textbook walking you through building an application from the ground up uh, using the planning techniques uh, designing the GUI and then actually uh, finishing off by well building the thing so I do recommend that you go through that yourself like I said in the last video now you might recall the planning steps from the last video and we only did steps one through four, which was actually figuring out what the application does. Um, We're going to cover step five, actually uh, sketch out the user interface so we know what the application should look like. And this is going to involve quite a bit because we have some, uh, standards involved that make sure that our user interfaces are well relatively friendly for people to use and that we don't um you know cause any harm or you know discriminate against someone for any number of reasons so that's a pretty big stack of concepts that we got to talk about in this video when it comes to just drawing out the sketch of the user interface. So let's just get right into it. So Windows has a set of design standards for applications. Um, design standards pretty much govern what a graphical user interface actually looks like. So the colors that are used and the layouts that are used, um, where certain buttons or text boxes or labels or whatever it might be. It governs what the text and the labels look like, all sorts of stuff like that. And there's a lot of reasons for it, reasons that I'll be touching on throughout this video, but the idea is you are helping establish a, um, a similar theme with a lot of other Windows applications when you follow the Windows design standards. Um, that helps uh, users of Windows computers feel familiar with an application. And a user that feels familiar with your application is a user that is much more easily able to learn how to use your application. If they can uh, anticipate where certain functionalities within your application might be, then they're going to have a much easier time using it for the first time, you know, learning it. They're not going to struggle uh, trying to figure everything out. They're not going to get discouraged, anything like that. It's really helpful to give your applications a familiar look and layout so that Windows users can learn how to use them. Now, something to note is that if you are working for a company, you're designing applications for a company, and they have a set of GUI standards that clash with Windows GUI standards, for the most part, the company GUI standards should supersede Windows standards. Now, problem might, problems might arise if the GUI standards for your company are actually, you know, not accessible, you know, Maybe uh, colorblind people can't actually uh, tell what's going on under your company's GUI standards, or the text isn't great for um, people with dyslexia or something like that. Um, then you would want to try to change those within your company according to best practices for, um, you know, standards for accessibility and all that kind of stuff. And I'll talk more about accessibility as we go along. But regardless, you would go with your company GUI standards and try to change your company standards from within if they um, disagree with you know any of the accessibility stuff or anything like that. Otherwise, if you are not working for a company that has specific GUI standards, 
regarding applications or anything like that, um, you are good to work under Windows standards. And you should. So first off, we can talk about interface organization, uh, how everything is actually laid out on the user interface. Where are all the buttons placed? Where is all the explanatory text placed? All that kind of stuff. So it is maybe much more than you think really important to lay out your interface and your application in a way that makes sense. Information should flow in a familiar direction for the user in a direction that makes sense. Uh, specifically, you want to use the direction that most intended users will read in. If you're building an application that you expect to be used in the United States or in many countries that have a writing system that goes left to right, top to bottom, you would want to follow that left to right, top to bottom. Uh, if you're if the flow of information or the flow of, um, you know, the user using the application goes right to left, they might be a little bit confused because they might assume we'll start with the top left control, start messing with that and see where things go. So you want to go left to right, top to bottom. The user should be first interacting with stuff at the top left and the flow of interaction should go left to right top to bottom. Now the user interface will normally have a couple of main types of arrangements. One is a vertical arrangement where you have columns of things that the user interacts with, where in they'll start with the leftmost column, go top to bottom, then the middle column, go top to bottom, then the rightmost column, go top to bottom, something like that. You might also have horizontal arrangements where there's a um, a row of things that the user interacts with, and then they move on to the next row of things that the user er, will interact with, and then the next row, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these interface arrangements are really helpful to keep in mind because they both are um, good ways to present information in a way that a user who is used to reading left to right, top to bottom, will understand. Related controls should be grouped together. So for example, you want to keep the, um, for the restaurant example that we were talking about last video, the restaurant tip calculator, you want to keep the bill amount, the monetary bill amount, and the percentage of tip that the user wants to uh, give. The text boxes where the user will enter that information in should be grouped together because they are related. They are related by way of the user, um, well, using them in order to actually get information out of the application. So you want to group together controls that serve a related purpose. Now there's a lot of things you can do in order to group controls together. You can take advantage of white space or space where there is no uh, control and it's just the background of the color of the form itself, you know, the background color of the application itself. Uh, if you use white space to group uh, certain controls together, that can help signify to the user like, oh, these controls are closer together and a little bit further apart from the other ones or the way that these uh, controls are ordered together with white space. Um, separating them from everything else makes it look like these are together. You can use that to direct the user's attention and to establish this flow of interaction and information within your GUI. An example of white space actually being used to group stuff together is how um, certain bullet points on my PowerPoint are indented in order to group them together. So this uh, indentation for group box panel and table layout panel right here groups them together and also the white space is being used to show that they are um, sub points, I guess, of this tools bullet point right here. So that's an example of white space grouping certain things together. Similar principle, but with controls. The other principle we have is uh, multiple tools that you can use in the container section of the toolbox. I'm not really going to go into that so much, and some of this will actually talk more about 
in future chapters. But these tools are actually able to um, group together multiple controls. You actually put controls within these uh, little containers right here. Like you might put, say, leftovers into a Tupperware or something. Um, but this container sort of holds the controls together. It signifies like, hey, all of these controls are related in some way, and it can actually keep them together physically as well. You can move the um, container around and all of the controls within stay with it and stay together in a particular orientation. So that's really helpful. You also want to maintain a consistent margin from the edges of the form. So controls uh, should not be too close to, say, the left-hand margin, but really far away from the right-hand margin or something like that. You want the left and right margin to be about equal. You want the top and bottom margins to be about equal. You probably want all the margins to be equal, really. But you want to maintain that consistent margin because otherwise that's going to be really distracting. Uh, the user's eyes are probably going to pick up on the difference if it's um, noticeable. And they're going to say, hey, why, why is this here? It's going to take their attention away from other parts of the application and it's going to make your application look unprofessional. You also want to align borders of the controls when possible, which means that you want the buttons, you know, buttons that are sitting next to each other. You don't want one slightly higher than the other. You want them to be at the same level. Uh, you don't want them kind of like offset or anything like that. Uh, and then you want to minimize the number of different margins appearing in the interface. So you want buttons to be evenly spaced out from each other. Uh, you don't want to vary that up too much because that can also be pretty distracting if your application's uh, margins, you know, the margins between different controls or anything like that. If it looks like a um, some kind of funhouse, uh, it can be a little bit distracting. So you don't want that. All right, so here we have an example of a vertical arrangement for the restaurant tip um, application. So we have in black are the actual um, elements that we would want to put within the application. So some image of a waiter, a uh, label that says, hey, this is a tip calculator. Um, you have the different text boxes and labels that users are going to be able to put information into and see information in, but you also have labels for each of the text boxes and labels itself that say, um, well, this is what they are. So that's what we're putting on this GUI. We're putting all the buttons with, you know, the button captions themselves. We're on that in a sec. Um, we're putting all the text boxes, all the labels, and even, you know, the explanatory labels, not just the ones where we're delivering information to the user, but also the labels that convey information about like what each text box does, the text box does, or the what the application does, or something like that. We really want to get an idea of the entirety of the application, not just the text boxes themselves and the buttons themselves, but also the labels that are going to be in there because the labels also contribute to the shape. They take up space within the application. And if they're taking up space within the application, if we don't plan for that ahead of time when we're actually sketching out the GUI, then we might run into some issues where we haven't planned out enough space in our application and we have to make all those changes on the fly. And that can be pretty rough. What you'll also see is some red text right here. Um, and these are all labeling each of the controls that are going to be you know, relatively important to the calculation of the tip. So we have labeled here the text boxes, uh, and these are labeled with what's going in their name property as well. You might be able to notice the, um, the naming conventions that we talked about in chapter one. But this uh, text, these text boxes right here are labeled with you know text bill, text percentage, like we talked about in the last uh, video. Uh, you know, they're labeled with their name. The label that actually 
will hold the output once we have calculated it has a name as well. It has a name because we need to put text into it and because we need to put text into it, we have to have a name to refer to it by. So that's why we had give it a name and that's why it, that name is written down right here. We're keeping track in the GUI sketch what each um, control is called because we want to know the placement of everything uh, that we've kind of hinted at in our planning stages and specifically step four. We want to make sure that all of this functionality, you know, we put down button calc here, we know what the functionality of button calc is because we've already planned that out, but we want to make sure that we are grouping together our related controls. So actually putting down the names of all of these controls, which we know are like we know what all those controls do, putting down the names and thus associating their functionality with the positions in our sketch helps us make sure that the related controls are indeed, uh, they, they are indeed groups together. So that's really important right there. But yeah, all the black text right here is stuff that is going to be shown to the user and all of the red text is all notes except for this black arrow and this black arrow here that's also kind of notes uh i don't know why that's not in red but so be it that is an example of a vertical arrangement of the restaurant's um tip application now if you take a look what i've done is i've shown the flow of information, the flow of interaction through the entire application using these blue arrows right here. Um, and, uh, you know, the user will start at the image because, hey, the image is like, it, it stands out. There's colors, there's shapes. We want to see what's going on here once they absorb the waiter image. Um, we're going to head over to tip calculator, left to right top to bottom and then they come down to this first column here uh they see all of this information all at once so not just the text boxes themselves but also the labels and you can see right here how the shape of these two different columns actually can show the reader that this in and of itself is in like one column so you go top to bottom and then this you would go top to bottom as well. That's going to feel more natural to, I would say, most users than to go from bill to calculate tip to tip percent to exit to tip. So they're going to follow this flow of information because this align this vertical alignment right here, and pretend that this box is a little more vertically aligned. But this alignment right here kind of signifies that this is all um, part of one group and that this should all be you know, processed or taken care of or whatever before going to the next group, which is a little bit lower down and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can also see for the most part, uh, pretty good alignment of margins on the left and right. Uh, top and bottom, it gets a little bit tricky, but um, this waiter image probably won't take up the entire box. It might be a transparent image that's more centered right here without necessarily knowing the image we can't say for sure but the top and bottom um, margin alignment isn't the greatest but you might not always get the best top and bottom margin alignment especially when you have things like the staggered columns or the image and also this space between the top and the cal tip calculator title which is pretty large so all of that is going to be um, maybe a little bit less easy to maintain and that's probably fine if you can't maintain a perfect top and bottom margin but left and right are really well aligned also you can see pretty good spacing between all of the buttons in the column it's not perfect it is a sketch but you would strive for good consistency of spacing between buttons you know the button same buttons in the column like this. So pretty good design. I briefly mentioned this before, but we also have some of uh, groups right here, which I have boxed up like so. 
Um, we have this top group, which is sort of information about the application. And then you go down into this next group, which is the first column. This is the column that the user actually puts information into and gets information out of. This is grouped together by um, you know, relevancy to the actual tip itself. It's grouped because the user is putting in information that you need to get the tip and then is also getting out information about the tip itself. So all of that is grouped together. And then you have this group right here, which is the interaction sort of group for this application. Um, I, I say the interaction group, the user is also interacting over here, but this is like the big cool buttons that you press in order to get your results uh, group, you could call it. You won't have just one of these groups for all applications that you'll ever have to design. The groups that you make will vary depending on the purpose of your application and how complex it is, but um, this is a pretty good example for a much simpler problem right here. We also have a horizontal arrangement example. Um, this is also pretty fun when it comes to playing with margins like this because we have some equal margins on the left and right over here. We also have equal margins on the left and right over by the calculate tip and exit buttons. They're different than the um, sort of tip information group area that we saw before, but what's important is that the margin by the bill area is equal to the margin by the tip area and the margin by the calculate tip area is equal to the margin by the exit area. You also see the spacing between the buttons is the same and will roughly correspond to the margin. Not quite, uh, at least in this sketch, but um, as long as these spaces in between the buttons are the same as each other and the margins are the same as each other, it's not the end of the world if the spaces in between the buttons are different than the margins, as long as you're minimizing how many differences in margins that you have. So there's a few differences in margins, but it's not crazy. So it looks fine. We got another flow of interaction and information idea. Again, pretty waiter image goes to tip calculator. Um, title goes to bill information, but then we take this long trip across the row and then go back down here to the uh, um, calculate tip and exit area and then take this trip across here. And that is how the user is going to probably process the information in this arrangement. So that is also another you know, ex example of making sure that a user that is used to reading left to right, top to bottom, is going to feel comfortable um, reading in this way. And we have our groups again. We have the um, information about the application at the very top, the bill information, the information the user puts in and also gets out regarding the bill. Um, and then the buttons, the, the main buttons area at the very bottom. So those are the groups for this particular arrangement. Now, the identifying labels. We saw these before in the um, examples of arrangements. These labels contain text and they identify another control's context. For example, the bill and tip percent labels that uh, identify the context for the um, text boxes that the user actually puts information to, or the um, uh, the label that identified the label that contains the user's calculated tip value. So that tip uh, value label that actually says, hey, this is what your tip is, and this label right here, whatever number this is, you know, that's how much you're going to be paying the server. So that is an identifying label. It is a label that identifies another controls context. It says what that control does. So the user is actually able to look at it and say, okay, this is what I need to do in order to work with this control. It should meaningfully describe that control. It should say, this is what the control 
does, or this is what the control takes in. This is the information you should put into the control, or this is what the control is telling you. All of that kind of stuff, um, that's what the identifying labels are all for. They should be left aligned rather than centered or right aligned. And you might have seen that, um, especially in the horizontal arrangement right here, where Bill is all the way over to the left. And Tip Percent and Tip, they're all all the way over to the left, as opposed to being in the middle. Uh, in most cases, they should be one to three words. Um, you should be able to describe what your controls are doing pretty succinctly in one to three words. If you need more description, then you probably need a second label full of like instructions or something like that at the very top of the page, or you need to put your instructions somewhere else. But they should be one to three words that just vaguely says this is what this is. Not vaguely, actually, uh, very meaningfully says this is what this is. And it should appear on one line, so you shouldn't have two lines of labels where there's text stacked on top of text in order to describe something. It should all appear on one line. It should be above or to the left of the control it identifies, and that will depend on the arrangement that you have. So for horizontal, it might some of the more horizontal arrangements, it might be on top because there's less room to the left or yeah, there's, there might be less room to the left of the control that it's identifying since you're stacking so many things on the same uh, row, the same line. Uh, on a more vertical arrangement, it, it might be to the left because uh, there might not be room on top or putting text on top of a control that's below another control might be a little bit confusing. So either above or to the left, where it, where it makes most sense and where you have most room to put it without cramming everything in. It should end with a colon, the two dots symbol in between the parentheses right here. And it should use sentence capitalization. So we talked about camel case before, um, where every word is capitalized and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about uh, sentence capitalization, which is actually what you can see on all of these bullet points right now where the first letter of the sentence is uppercase and everything else is lowercase, except for proper nouns or anything like that. Buttons work a little bit differently than some of the other controls that a user will interact with because they have text that appears on the button's face, so they don't need their own separate identifying label, uh, usually. Maybe you come across an exception where a button needs an identifying label and also a caption, or maybe you're using identifying labels for a group of buttons or something like that, but typically you'll be relying on the button's caption to show what the button is doing. So yeah, the button has a caption that is text that appears on its face and it describes what clicking the button does, like show equation, hide equation, exit, um, calculate uh, tip, something like that. Captions should be meaningful, like identifying labels, should be one to three words appear on one line, sentence capitalization. So that that's all um, really important information for the button caption. Now, if you have multiple buttons and they are all stacked vertically, the buttons should have the same height and width, which will probably be determined by the size of the button's caption, among other things. Um, if positioned horizontally, the buttons should be the same height. The width may vary if uh, you need it to or something like that. Uh, maybe it looks better varied, maybe it looks better if they're all the same width, whatever. But they should be the same height if they're positioned horizontally next to each other. So one is on the left, one is on the right. As opposed to stacked vertically where there's one on top, one on bottom, or something like that. Also, the most commonly used button is going to appear first, on top of a column or the leftmost button of a row. For example, calculate tip is going to um, show up first because the user is more likely to try to calculate the tip first, and they might also try to calculate multiple tips. Um, if you put exit first, 
uh, that might feel a little bit weird because it's almost like you're expecting the user to exit the application before actually interacting with it, which I'm sure you're not, but it might come off that way. It might feel a little strange. So you want to put the most commonly used button first. Graphics. These are the pictures that you might want to put in your application, but you should use them very sparingly. Um, too many graphics or the wrong graphic that might be a little too flashy or colorful or something like that can be distracting and it can actually affect the user uh, being able to use your application. Uh, so you want to be careful about how you use your graphics. You want to use them when it's best to use them. So some examples of good times to use graphics are to emphasize or clarify a portion of the screen, maybe using like arrows or something like that. Um, if you want to put a company logo, you know, if you're designing an application for a company, uh, putting a graphic, you know, a company logo up in the upper left might be helpful. Uh, and then it's also good for aesthetics if they're small or placed in a non-distracting location. Hypothetically, you know, if we make the tip calculator application for an Italian restaurant so they can um, give out, you know, tablets or whatever to the users or like to their patrons and the patrons can calculate the tip using your application. Um, maybe you might put some uh, very, you know, low key understated pictures of grapevines crawling up the sides of the application or something like that to like really build up the aesthetics of this Italian restaurant uh, application. Uh, nothing too uh, startling or attention grabbing or anything like that, just something really nice on the side. Fonts. Uh, fonts are uh, essentially what decide what the letters on any computer program will look like. Uh, you might be familiar with fonts like Times New Roman or Comic Sans or anything like that, but um, fonts are actually really important because they can affect readability. And if your users cannot read the text on your GUI, then they're not really going to be able to interact with your application very well. So you want to use only one font type for all text in the interface. You don't want to switch up fonts all the time. You want to keep it consistent, which is less distracting. And also you can guarantee that it's a lot more readable. Typically, um, Segoy UI, I believe is the pronunciation of that, but I could not find a pronunciation, but that is the standard Windows uh, user interface font for, well, all Windows applications. It's a good font. It's considered pretty readable and relatively uh, dyslexic friendly, which is always a plus. Uh, if you're not using that for whatever reason, you want to look for a font that is sans serif. So no like funny um, connections between words, non-oblique. So it's not like slanted or anything like that. Uh, and monospace, where all of the letters are the same width as all the other letters. Uh, another example of a good font that is sans serif, non oblique, and monospace is Arial, which is what I'm using for this presentation. And you can find a lot more. Uh, you want to use no more than two different font sizes, uh, maybe a font for regular text and a font for maybe some explanatory text or something like that, or maybe you have a title font size, sorry, a, a title font size versus a font size for regular text, all that kind of stuff. Avoid italics and underlining because they can make it hard to read for people who have trouble with um, distinguishing different letters in text or however, you know, whatever mechanisms have there are for people to have trouble with readability, 
italics and underlining can make it hard to distinguish certain letters from each other, so that should be avoided. And bold should be limited to titles, headings, and key items to emphasize. So if there's like a really important input for the user to put in, that might be bolded. Titles might be bolded. Headings might be bolded. Like if you have a heading that describes a certain um, group of controls, that might be good to emphasize with bold text. But otherwise, you want to keep it non-bold. You want to keep it uh, standard. Color should be used sparingly. Um, you're going to usually use black, white, and gray to build up your interface. Uh, gray backgrounds, black text, or white backgrounds, or whatever, but black text for the most part. Uh, you can add color afterwards if there's a good reason, like trying to possibly emphasize something or whatever, but use it very sparingly and use it only if you only if it's a really good reason. And the problem with using colors, especially if you're using multiple colors, uh, is that it can have all of these unintended consequences that you might not realize at first, nor if you show it to other people, they may not realize it at first, but then it might come back and bite you. So you want to be careful with it. Colors or users, some users may have color blindness or color confusion, and if that gets in the way of using a critical application, that actually could risk legal trouble. Um, so that's something you really want to be careful about. Color is also subjective, so a color that looks really nice to you might be um, absolutely horrific to other users, and that might affect you know, their desire to continue using the application or something like that. Uh, so you want to worry about that because you, you know, you're building things for other people to solve problems with. If other people don't want to use your solution, then that is kind of a problem. And then colors may have different associations across different cultures or even within the same culture. Uh, there is, at least at the time of filming, a somewhat popular meme going around on certain areas of the internet where a uh, children's hospital had redecorated. Um, they, they redecorated the, the hospital and added up all kinds of you know, new colors and aesthetics and all that kind of stuff, but they uh, decided to put some decorations along the floor, like these lines that... Uh, kind of went all around the floor and into different rooms, including into some of the patients' rooms and out of the patients' rooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they wanted to paint the lines a certain color that would represent healing and love and all that kind of stuff. And they chose red, so you have these massive red trails going out of patients' rooms and down the hallways of this hospital, and I imagine I don't have to talk about why that's a bad idea. But it's a great example of unintentional use of color, or unintentional misuse of color. It's very easy to have happen, so you really want to be careful with regards to your use of color because the less you use color, the less you have to worry about coming across any of this. And when you use color, you have to actually be vigilant, actively vigilant, especially when it comes to things like color blindness or color confusion. You have to be vigilant about being careful about that, making sure that there's um, no way that users getting colors confused will impact their ability to use the program. So colors are you know, they come with a lot of concerns. So some recommendations for using colors in your applications. Um, black text with white, off-white, or a light gray background is best. It's going to be the most readable. Act pretty much exactly like what I have on this PowerPoint right here. Black text, white background, or off-white, or light gray, or something like that. But it's easier to read. 
Um, it's going to be a, a lot easier on your user's eyes. Dark backgrounds and light text, um, like on some old-fashioned uh, you know, terminals where people program and all that kind of stuff, that can actually strain some user's eyes quite a bit. Some people like um, night mode on certain applications and anything like that, but it's never going to be too dark of a background with white text. Uh, because there's a certain limit you can go with night mode before it gets to be too dark and then that can cause quite a bit of eye strain. Um, so black text with a white or off-white or very light gray background is very helpful there. Uh, you want to limit color use to three colors uh, with those three colors excluding white, black, and gray. So you can do white, black, and gray along with at most three colors. Um, but make sure that the colors you choose actually complement each other because if they clash, that can also cause some amount of eye strain. Um, if you use color to identify an important element, make sure to add some other means of identification. So for example, using a label to identify a colored Control. Maybe you highlighted a certain control in yellow to signify that it's important, but also make sure that that highlight also comes with some label that says this is important or something like that. Uh, the reason why is because if a colorblind person is not able to distinguish what that color is, um, then they're not going to be able to tell what the significance of that color is. So like, you know, maybe you have a whole bunch of red buttons and then you make the button green it, so that the user knows, okay, click this one now. And then the next button turns green so the user clicks that one. Someone who's red, green, colorblind may not be able to tell the difference between the red and the green if you use, well, especially if you use the wrong shades of red and green and they look exactly the same. But even then, uh, they might not know that, oh, all of these are red except for the green one. Um, I don't know. If all of them are green except for one red one, or all of them are red except for one green one, so I don't know what to do. That's why you need to add some kind of label to identify it. And then you also want to make sure that your text color has enough contrast with the background color, and that's not going to be a problem if your text is black with a white background or an off-white background or a light gray background, but if you are choosing the gray background, make sure that there's enough context contrast between the gray and the black so that people can very easily read the text. Even if you can easily read it, if it's easy for you, other people may not have an easy time with it. They might be unable to read it. So make sure that there's enough contrast. That's an actual, uh, considered an actual issue of accessibility. So if you want to learn more about uh, the GUI design guidelines, there's a couple places I recommend. Appendix A in our textbook has more information about GUI design guidelines. It's very informative, so I highly recommend you check that out. You can access it by, um, it should be in our uh, module with all the helpful resources in it, and you can also access it directly through MindTap by opening up the full textbook. You can also check out the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or the WCAG, which is the set of guidelines that are pretty much the, the standard for how we design for accessibility on the World Wide Web. Any uh, website that is worth its salt is going to follow these guidelines in order to make sure that people can actually you know, use the website. And it's what I personally use whenever I'm trying to design something for visual, at the very least, accessibility among other things, but it's a very helpful resource as well, and you can probably apply it outside of just creating websites. So I highly recommend um, taking a look through that. You can also, you know, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me. You should also be able to Google um, whatever your question might be, like uh, words, I guess like, um, Color uh, Contrast Guidelines, WCAG, or something like that. And that would pull up that kind of information. But 
Just note that wherever the WCAG and the GUI design guidelines for this class disagree, if they do end up disagreeing, um, go with the GUI design guidelines for this class. Uh, however, if the GUI design guidelines don't say something, but the WCAG does say something, then maybe go with the what the WCAG is saying rather than assuming that it's going to be all good. It's better to be more on top of accessibility than less. So. so that's designing the user interface. And with that, that actually wraps up the fifth point in actually uh, planning out your application. So between the previous video and this one, this is all the information you need in order to actually make a comprehensive plan about how to design your application. Now there's a couple more videos. Uh, they are much less sort of in depth than the previous two, and they uh, involve actually um, when you're working on creating your application. And some of this has to do with work that's done in the design period. But when you're actually uh, working on your application, uh, the next two videos are going to govern uh, things you do that control how users are able to interact with your application using only their keyboard. So it's a pretty neat uh, series. It's a, it's a pretty neat uh, set of concepts and such, and you might actually learn something pretty cool about how to interact with applications uh, for yourself. So look forward to that.